amoral, cunning, ruthless, and instructive. The 48 Laws of Power, written by Robert Greene and designed by Juice Delfers, is a piercing distillation of 3,000 years of the history of power. A synthesis of in-depth research into the philosophies of such great thinkers as Machiavelli, Sun Tzu, and Karl von Clausewitz. And the and the legacies of statesmen, warriors, seducers, and con men throughout the ages. The 48 Laws of Power is the definitive study of power and the essential guide to modern manipulation. It is uh, Thursday, uh, September the 12th, or no, excuse me, September the 14th. This is Ron. Welcome to Storytime. And uh, this is part two of my review of uh, the 48 Laws of Power. I've uh, read uh, each chapter, or at least uh, excerpts from each chapter of the 48 Laws of Power. Now I'm going to go ahead and review it using the preface as a guide. Half of your mastery of power comes from what you do not do, what you do not allow yourself to get dragged into. For this skill, you must learn to judge all things by what they cost you. As Nietzsche wrote, the value of a thing sometimes lies not in what one attains with it, but in what one pays for it, what it costs us. Perhaps you will attain your goal and a worthy goal at that, but at what price? Apply this standard to everything, including whether to collaborate people or to come to their aid. In the end, life is short, opportunities are few, and you only have so much energy to draw on. And in this uh, sense, time is as important a consideration as any other. Never waste valuable time or mental peace of mind on the affairs of others. That is a too high a price to pay. And so what he's uh, basically suggesting is that everybody should be uh, cold-blooded and um, refuse to, uh, especially with coming to people's aid. Um, and uh, that's, again, a lot of this is, uh, question is, is this the person, kind of person I want to be? If I follow these 48 laws of power, is this going to make me a better person or a worse person? And in, uh, I think, almost all cases, a worse person. Power is a social game. To learn and master it, you must develop the ability to study and understand people. As the great 17th century thinker and courtier um, wrote, uh, Balsian Gras- Bals. Tazar Gracian wrote, Many people spend time studying the properties of animals or herbs. How much more important it would be to study those of people with whom we must live or die. To be a master player, you must also be a master psychologist. You must recognize motivations and see through the cloud of dust with which people surround their actions. An understanding of people's hidden motives is the single greatest piece of knowledge you can have in acquiring power. It opens up endless possibilities of deception, seduction, and manipulation, and um, it, not quite true. I mean, there's uh, it, it can understanding people can lead to a certain amount of, I suppose, peace of mind, but uh, power, no, not at all. And I'll be explaining this uh, in, a, in my next episode, in which I will be um, uh, telling you what are the true laws of power. People are of an infinite complexity, and you can spend a lifetime watching them without ever fully understanding them. So it is all the more important, then, to begin your education now. In doing so, you must also keep one principle in mind. Never discriminate as to whom you study and whom you trust. Never trust anyone completely and study everyone, including friends and loved ones. Finally, you must learn always to take the indirect route to power. Disguise your cunning. Like a billiard ball that caroms several times before it hits its target... Your moves must be planned and developed in the least obvious way. By training yourself to be indirect, you can thrive in the modern court, appearing the paragon of decency while being the consummate manipulator. And again, there is no modern court because there is no concentration of power uh, as uh, there was in uh, courts of old. Uh, Power today is extremely diffuse. So... Consider the 48 Laws of Power a kind of handbook on the arts of indirection. The laws are based on the writings of men and women who have studied and mastered the game of power. These writings span a period of more than 3,000 years and were created in civilizations as disparate as ancient China and Renaissance Italy. Yet, they share common threads and themes, together hinting at an essence of power that has yet to be fully articulated. 
the 48 Laws of Power, the distillation of this accumulated wisdom, gathered from the writings of the most illustrious strategists, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, statesmen, Bismarck, Talleyrand, courtiers, Castiglione, Gracian, seducers, Ninon de Lenclos and Casanova, and con artists, Yellow Kid Wheel, in history. The laws have a simple premise. Certain actions almost always increase one's power, the observance of the law, while others decrease it and even ruin us, the transgression of the law. These transgressions and observations, observances are illustrated by historical examples. The laws are timeless and definitive. The 48 laws of power can be used in several ways. By reading the book straight through, you can learn about power in general. Although several of the laws may seem not to pretend directly to your life, in time you'll probably find that all of them have some application and that, in fact, they are interrelated. By getting an overview of the entire subject, you will best be able to evaluate your own past actions and gain a greater degree of control over your immediate affairs. A thorough reading of the book will inspire thinking and reevaluation long after you finish it. The book has also been designed for browsing and for examining the law that seems at the particular moment the most pertinent to you. Say you are experiencing problems with a superior and cannot understand why your efforts have not led to more gratitude or a promotion. Several laws specifically address the master-underling relationship and you are almost always certainly transgressing one of them. By browsing the initial paragraphs for the 48 laws in the table of contents, you can identify the pertinent law. Finally, the book can be browsed through and picked apart for entertainment, for an enjoyable ride through the foibles and great deeds of our predecessors in power. A warning, however, to those who use the book for this purpose. It might be better to turn back. Power is endlessly seductive and deceptive in its own way. It is a labyrinth. Your mind becomes consumed with solving its infinite problems, and you soon realize how pleasantly lost you have become. In other words, it becomes amusing by taking it seriously. Do not be frivolous with such a critical matter. The gods of power frown on the frivolous. They give ultimate satisfaction only to those who study and reflect and punish those who skim the surfaces looking for a good time. And um, that's exactly, though, what uh, the book is really all about. It's all only, and it's all only good for is uh, entertainment. It can provide really little, no um, instruction. It really doesn't promise to do so, to provide any, any instruction or any increase in one's uh, power at all. Um, let's see. I'm also, there's the way the book has been written is that most of the uh, passages are in black and white, but in the margins, he's included certain little anecdotes and and whatnot in uh, printed in red. And uh, so, let's see. Uh, here's one by Lord Chesterfield. Courts are unquestionably the seats of politeness and good breeding. Were they not so, they would be the seats of slaughter and desolation. Those who now smile upon and embrace would affront and stab each other if manners did not interpose. The next one from Frederick Nietzsche. There's nothing very odd about lambs disliking birds of prey, but this is no reason for holding it against the large birds of prey that they carry off lambs. And when the lambs whisper among themselves... These birds of prey are evil, and does this not give us a right to say that whatever is the opposite of a bird of prey must be good? There's nothing intrinsically wrong with such an argument, though these birds of prey will look somewhat quizzically and say, we have nothing against these good lambs. In fact, we love them. Nothing tastes better than a tender lamb. Another one from Johann von Goethe. The only means to gain one's ends with people are force and cunning. Love also, they say, but that is to wait for sunshine, and life needs every moment. And the fine one, of, finally, by um, Kautilya, uh, which is an Indian philosopher from 3rd century B.C., the arrow shot by the archer may or may not kill a single person, but stratagems devised by a wise man can kill even babes in the womb. And uh, that kind of sums it up for me right there is uh, what kind of a person am I going to be? Am I gonna, is, is that the person I want to be is to walk into a cocktail party and introduce myself? Hi, I'm Ron, and I kill babies in the womb. I don't think so. Another one. I thought to myself, with what means, what deceptions, with how many varied arts, and with what industry a man sharpens his wits to deceive another? And through these variations, the world is made more beautiful. Hmm. 
There are no principles. There are only events. There is no good and bad. There are only circumstances. The superior man espouses events and circumstances in order to guide them. If there were principles and fixed laws, nations would not change them as we change our shirts. And a man cannot be expected to be wiser than an entire nation. And that was uh, written by Honoré de Balzac. And the previous one was by Francesco Vettori, a contemporary and friend of Machiavelli in the early 16th century. So, um, again, it's uh, might makes right, the ends justify the means. Uh, there is no uh, right and wrong. But the fact of the matter is that there is uh, right and wrong. And we know this because we can know things with certainty. We can know things with certainty because existence is primary. Um, if you want to follow the 48 laws of power, you have to believe the contrary, that consciousness is primary, and that, uh, therefore, nothing can be known with certainty, and, therefore, there are no universal rights and wrongs. But it's uh, simply incorrect. We know these things, by the way, by the evidence of our senses, by what we see and experience around us each and every day. And a lot of this, uh, the book is uh, uh, dealing with Again, it comes down to an, an issue of what kind of person do I want to be. Uh, the people that are described and held up uh, for admiration in the book, are these the kinds of people that I want to be? Do I want to be known as a uh, yellow kid? Uh, do I want to be a con artist and uh, stealing from people and uh, really basically having no friends, no life uh, whatsoever? No, I don't. Uh, my interest is in pursuing happiness and uh, following the so-called laws in this book um, aren't going to get me there. The other thing is, is this interesting is he calls it the 48 laws of power. Okay, fine. Why 48 laws? Why not 47? Why not 50? Why not 150? No answer. So I don't know why or how he came up with uh, the uh, figure of 48, but uh, I, I assume as it seems to be with everything else in the book, that it's arbitrary, that his uh, decision was arbitrary. So um, let's see. I'm going to go ahead now and uh, look at some of the, uh, take some of the chapters that and uh, uh, use them as uh, examples for what I'm talking about. Never outshine the master is uh, chapter or law one. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior in your desire to please and improve press them, don't go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. But again, um, who are we talking about when he doesn't say who, who's the master? I mean, we, in the stories that he's telling, it's obvious who that is. In the case of the finance minister and the king, uh, the king is the obviously the master. But what about when I'm at work? What about if I'm on uh, at one point in my life, I was a uh, the head referee for um, an AYSO region, and uh, so there was uh, we were on a board like a board of directors, and so there's a, a certain little bit of intrigue there, I suppose. But who's the master there? Who is it that uh, in that situation? What about uh, family life? What about um, friends and hobbies and things of that nature? Where where's the master? Who's the master? that uh, I have to be careful not to outshine. Uh, never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. And the one thing in that chapter that he's just uh, talking about in Law 2, he says, if you don't have any enemies, make some. And it seems to me that's just absolutely ridiculous on its face. Um, so why, why would I want to go ahead and make, make enemies? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, let's see what else we've got here for some of these... Uh, Let's look, do it from the back. Uh, let me see. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. Um, and the question is, what kind of reputation? Court attention at all costs. Mm, some of these also seem rather contradictory. Court attention at all, all costs, but on the other hand, never outshine the master. Um, let's see what else. Went through actions, never through argument. Um... I, again, uh, it's impossible to go uh, along with that particular law. Avoid the unhappy and unlucky, but um, I don't know that's so, so much about power as it is about happiness. You, 
would rather um, stay away from unhappy and unlucky people uh, because they're going to just bring you down psychologically. Uh, the idea of learning to keep people dependent on you seems rather disgusting on its face. Selective honesty and generous generosity to disarm your victim and in that chapter they're basically saying be dishonest and uh, disingenuous as a rule and only become honest or generous uh, when it's going to aid in your ability to uh, manipulate or fool other people again rather disgusting not making for um, a very good person um, when asking for help appeal, appeal to people's self-interest never to their mercy or gratitude um, and again, I don't see in that particular situation how you're going to get any power out of that. Uh, pose as a friend, work as a spy. Uh, and a lot of what they're talking, he's talking about in this 48 Laws of Power is a lot of work. Uh, he says in the preface that you have to sp spend a lifetime studying people. And it seems to me that you're doing a whole lot of work for um, rather dubious Outcomes. There's no guarantees, after all, that any of these um, recommendations that he's making are going to result in an increase in power, uh, or at least in, in an appreciable increase in power. Crush your enemy totally. Um, know who you're dealing with. Do not offend the wrong person. And I, I think it's the idea is you don't offend anybody. If you try to uh, do the, the best you can not to offend people, to be polite to everybody, you're not going to have that problem. You don't have to bother doing a lot of research and figuring out who's who um, in order to not offend uh, the wrong person. Uh, here's another one that's very cynical. Play a sucker to catch a sucker. Seem dumber than your mark. But I'm not, I'm not interested in marks. I don't want to associate with marks. Uh, I want to associate with people that are enlightened, enlightening, and that are going to... Uh, uh, be a pleasure to be around. Use the surrender tactic. Transform weakness into power. And that's, uh, that's one that's just based strictly on luck or assuming that your opponent is going to make a mistake. This is uh, an attitude in chess that um, says you should not set traps because there's books are devoted to certain uh, traps in chess, trapping your opponent in various ways to get them to either lose the game or uh, at, l at the very least lose a piece. And the reason they say you shouldn't use traps is because it assumes that your opponent is going to blunder. It assumes that your opponent is going to go ahead and make uh, some fairly grievous mistakes. And the same thing with the tactic of surrender, of transforming weakness into power. The particular chapter they used the example of a king, uh, a Chinese king, who surrendered to the uh, second Chinese king and was, as I said yesterday, um, uh, taken you know, into custody and he was turned into a stable boy for a certain period of time. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find that story. Which one is that one? It's 22. Let's see if we can find it. And um, because it, it just... When you are weaker, never fight for honor's sake. Choose surrender instead. Surrender gives you time to recover, time to torment and irritate your conqueror, time to wait for his power to wane. Do not give him the satisfaction of fighting and defeating you. Surrender first. By turning the other cheek, you infuriate and unsettle him. Make surrender a tool of power. And let's find uh, uh, here the uh, exact story. Let's see... That's the island of Malos, and we don't want that one. Uh, let's see. There it is. In uh, 473 BC, in ancient China, King Gujian of Wei suffered a horrible defeat from the ruler of Wu in the Battle of Fujiao. Gujian wanted to flee, but he had an advisor who told him to surrender and to place himself in the service of the ruler Wu, from which position he could study the man and plot his revenge. Deciding to follow his advice, Gujian gave the ruler all of his riches and went to work in his conqueror's stables as the lowest servant. For three years, he humbled himself before the ruler, who then, finally satisfied of his loyalty, allowed him to return home. 
Inwardly, however, Gujan had spent those three years gathering information and plotting revenge. When a terrible drought struck Wu and the kingdom was weakened by inner turmoil, he raised an army, invaded, and won with ease. That's the power behind surrender. It gives you the time and the flexibility to plot a devastating counterblow. Had Gujian run away, he would have lost his chance. Well, uh, what he simply did was put him on, him, so Gujian put himself under the tender mercies of um, the, the ruler of Wu. Uh, the ruler of Wu went ahead and put him in uh, the stables as a lowest servant, but he could have just as easily had him beheaded uh, or killed and after three years, uh, the ruler of Wu allowed him to return home. Well, he could have just as easily kept him in the stables and for the rest of his life. And he could have spent the rest of his life plotting his revenge and getting nowhere. So uh, it seems that um, surrender may be the best option in some cases uh, in order to, to cut your losses, but it uh, certainly isn't the route to power. And uh, so anyways, that concludes the uh, 48 Laws of Power and my, basically my summation of it. Um, other than, like I said, he doesn't define his terms. He doesn't define what is power. There's not a lot in the black and white sections of references to where he's getting his information. He tells various stories and anecdotes, but there's no footnotes to uh, show where it is that he's getting his information. So uh, it seems that that's of dubious value in uh, or dubious authenticity uh, and something again should be taken with a grain of salt the whole book should be uh, it's worth reading again as a form of entertainment it's very uh, interesting in terms of reading uh, the stories of uh, various people in history and how they have uh, fared in their uh, power struggles over the years other than that it really misses the mark and uh, again, next, what I'm going to do on uh, Thursday, the um, so I'm wondering, I'm just thinking right now, did I say that today was Thursday the 14th? Yes, it is. That's right. So I'm not going to do it on Thursday. I'm doing it on Saturday. I don't know. I keep thinking for, for a second there. I thought this was Tuesday. But anyhow, on Saturday the 16th that... Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, present a few um, of what I know to be the real uh, laws of power, and I'll give you the reasons uh, behind um, why it is I believe those are or know those to be laws of power. Anyways, uh, until then, until Saturday, September the 16th, uh, thank you for joining me, and have a great day.